Some generals say, give the soldiers what they want, but that's not my approach. My job is to figure out what the soldier's going to want before they even know what it is. I present to you the self-propelled Korean K-9 Thunder Artillery. Second, the K-10 ammunition companion vehicle for fast reloading. And third, the biggest innovation of all, the ability to have basically the equivalent of fully automatic artillery cannon. The 155mm K9 Thunder is combat proven against North Korea. Today, it's an extremely successful vehicle with over 1,700 having been produced. Each one costs about $2.9 million per unit, so you can almost trade one in for the cost of a single home in America. The K9 has many of the same capabilities that were originally supposed to be in the United States prototype XM2001 Crusader, but that $11 billion program in the United States was canceled. With its auto loader and new fire control system, it has an insanely high rate of fire for artillery, 10 rounds per minute. That's four rounds faster per minute than the old technology. So this is what you call in when you need an entire mountain removed from the face of the earth. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi even hopped onto the K-9 artillery for a quick spin around the block. I feel like we should make it a best practice to have world leaders fire off some artillery rounds if they get into a war. The amount of nations opening up factories to produce their own licensed version of the K-9 Thunder is incredible. Turkey, Estonia, Australia, India, Finland, Norway, Poland, Egypt all want a piece of that South Korean burst artillery. 624 of these will be produced inside of Poland. Each license South Korea sells to a foreign country, they get about $1.7 billion, and their defense company Hanwha helps set up the manufacturing franchises. It's like a delicious spicy McDonald's franchise, but for artillery pieces. So what is it about South Korean artillery technology that makes everybody want it? The development of this weapon tells us a lot about the South Korean people's history, their culture, and what matters to them. It evolved under the intense pressure to counter increasingly radical North Korean dictators. The origins of the K-9 Thunder are actually closely tied to the Korean War. This weapon really could only ever evolve from a country that has technically been in a state of war for the past 70 years, while literally staring down thousands of artillery barrels along a 160 mile front line in the world's most heavily fortified border, the Korean Demilitarized Zone. Artillery really defines this entire region. To put the artillery threat in Korea into perspective, North Korea could bombard Seoul with over 10,000 projectiles every minute. For context, according to data from the European Commission, rough estimates indicate that Russia fires between 40,000 and 50,000 artillery shells per day, compared to the 6,000 shells per day on average that Ukrainian forces expend. Which means that in the absence of counter-battery fire, a quick response from Seoul, it would only take North Korea five minutes to fire more rounds than what we've learned the Russo-Ukrainian war consumes in an average day. This is why the development of artillery weapons has historically been so important, not just to military strategy for South Korea, but also North Korea. North Korea likes to call this artillery power by a metaphor, the sea of fire. In fact, a quick search of the official North Korean English language news site, KCNA, which has served as a government's mouthpiece in North Korea for more than half a century, shows just how common the phrase is. Because when the Korean War hostilities ended in 1953, both countries remained at war, and so they immediately switched over to pouring money into an arms race. You might be surprised that North Korea actually held the economic and technological advantage over South Korea until the late 1960s. This is when they received the American M107 175mm self-propelled howitzer. In 1971, as the US was trying to phase out the system in favor of newer systems, the M107 had a fire rate which was about one round per minute, which wasn't mind blowing, but it did have greater accuracy at 25 mile maximum firing range. In response, the North Koreans fired back with their very own M1978 Koksan, a 170 millimeter self-propelled gun that was basically a carbon copy of the Soviet made S-23. This created a problem though for our soldiers. It matched the firing range of the American M107, but also saved on headcount, needing five fewer crew members. It was like the military version of speeding through the express checkout lane, ha 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 ha. On top of that, they introduced rocket-assisted projectiles, which stretched their range for an extra 12 miles, putting their southern counterparts' abilities for artillery to shame at the time. 
All we're missing is a show to go with this beautiful dinner, darling. There they are, get them. Looks like the show just arrived a little late. You need to work on your movie puns and quips. I'll tell you what I need to work on, my collection of die-cast mini metal replica goat guns. They range from four to 16 inches in length, they're durable, and they make for the perfect centerpiece during a romantic dinner with your loved one when you're shooting all the bad guys in the face. From the moment I first laid eyes on you inside that goat gun store on Long Island, back when we were both undercover double, triple agents, I knew you were the one I wanted to shoot six to 16 ounce goat guns with for the rest of my life. They even come, oh, they even come in great packaging. You're too late, Cappy Bond. The mind control device is already in place. Soon the whole city will be under my control. Babe, I know I promised we wouldn't fight tonight, but I'm gonna make an exception for this baddie. You can click the link in the description to buy yourself or a loved one a goat gun today. They're the perfect collectible or centerpiece for a gamer, veteran, or history buff shelf at home. But it wasn't all sunshine and roses for the Coxan. It had a much lower operational range and moved about as fast as a snail carrying a heavy backpack. And when it came to rounds per minute, let's just say it wasn't winning any speed contests at two rounds every five minutes. At this point, both sides had a glaring common problem their artillery crews were left hanging out to dry. As mobile warfare took center stage, the vulnerability of artillery crews working in an open air environment became painfully clear. With crews exposed to the elements of flying shrapnel all over the place, it wouldn't take much to render a gun combat ineffective, even if the cannon itself wasn't damaged or destroyed, but the soldiers manning it were. To top it off, North Korea started cranking out towed howitzers and M1978 coxans like they were going out of style. Analysts believe the North produced 500 of them, which forced South Korea to start thinking about ways to keep the balance of power. A study from the RAND Corporation sheds light on how the artillery battle inside Korea shaped the Hermit Kingdom. At that time, the North feared that South Korea would eventually catch up to them in firepower. The Kim Dynasty realized that if it didn't retain the reins of power, the great leader and his family were unlikely to even stay alive. When the stakes are this high, all modesty goes out the window, so the regime decided to double down on artillery, as well as new kinds of munitions that the artillery could deliver, the development and production of weapons of mass destruction. The North Korean leader did this because he had caught on early how weak authoritarian regimes could be toppled and replaced more easily without WMDs. In response, the North Korean regime doubled down on artillery and the South Korean military's lack of battlefield artillery protection in December 1983. Officials from the US and South Korea agreed to co-produce a South Korean licensed variant of the M109A2 Paladin. And although South Korea wanted to produce every part of the vehicle domestically to be more self-reliant and grow their own defense industry, the conditions of the agreement meant that 37% of the parts still needed to be imported. This frustrated the heck out of South Korea's military because despite being an excellent system in its own right, it was still decades old, meaning it needed to be upgraded. To solve the range advantage, the North Korea's new M1989 Koksan had gained over them. To keep up with the edge of the arms race, the Republic of Korea ROK Ministry of Defense ordered the development of a new system with a longer range, a faster firing rate, and a higher amount of mobility using the experience gained from the licensed production of the K-55 and entrusted this important task to the South Korean Agency for Defense Development. Interestingly enough, the ADD researchers in South Korea had already been collecting data since 1983 in anticipation of a future artillery system. They believed that burst fire and quick relocation would become the dominant factors in artillery battles and built an automatic loading system for testing in 1984. Much later, in 1987, the South Korean ADD offered an upgraded plan to the existing K-55 inspired by the United States M109 Howitzer Improvement Program. But it was rejected by the Republic of Korea Army in 1988. As a result, the development of what would become the K-9 Thunder began with no intellectual property strings to hold them back. The work started in 1989, and Samsung Aerospace Industries was invited to participate which is now Hanwha Defense. However, the technical requirements for the new weapon were ever increasing as the DMZ got more and more fortified. To put it into perspective, the International Institute for Strategic Studies estimates that North Korea has more than 21,000 artillery pieces and multiple rocket launchers along the front. 
compared to the 11,000 from South Korea. This is seven times more than all the combined artillery deployed to the Ukrainian war by both sides. And the rest of the numbers on the Korean Peninsula are just like that. Insane amounts of equipment that are the product of each side preparing for decades for an all or nothing massive battle. My grandfather, Peter Margarita, was drafted to be an artilleryman in the Korean War, and they did so many fire missions that they were nearly deaf after the first month, he said. He had to hold his hand on the telephone to feel the vibration of the fire mission phone ringing so that he knew there was a call for a fire mission for his gun section. But the K-9 had its share of problems during development. It turns out the system had the same problems that Germany's PZH-2000 saw in its development. You see, the long 52 caliber barrel turned out to be more difficult to balance than the older K-55 it was supposed to improve upon. And the mechanism used to fix the problem made the hydraulic generators sound so loud that the crew would rather cover their ears than aim the gun. So a group of small folks from the ADD and Seoul National University of Science and Technology had to work out a fancy math model to fix the problem without having to change the design entirely. Based on review of the required operational capability, in October 1992, a firing rate of three shots within 15 seconds was chosen for economic feasibility. The rationale was that it was difficult for a target to be out of fatal range within 15 seconds after the first impact, and that the firing rate can be shortened depending on training level. If a firing rate of three shots in 10 seconds was demanded, it would have a huge increase in development costs as well as unnecessary burden on researchers at the time. But then the development was delayed between March to August 1993 for a strange reason. There was a purge of Hanho. This was a private military club within the Republic of Korea armed forces who were aligned with the military dictator Chun Doo Hwan. The democratically elected South Korean president at the time, President Kim Young Sam, decided to get rid of this group. The Army Logistics Department refused to sign the letter of agreement for the XK-9 until a development plan for the maintenance elements were created. When the Joint Chiefs of Staff finalized the system development agreement in late August 1993, the Defense Ministry approved the prototype development plan in September and the President approved the project in early October. In 1993, the system was designed to be able to outrange any future North Korean artillery system with a maximum effective range of 25 miles or 40 kilometers with standard ammunition and up to 31 miles or 50 kilometers with special extended range munitions. However, it had issues overcoming a 45% localization range, which meant it could only accurately locate its targets before firing half the time. Apparently, when you put a howitzer on a vehicle and lob a shell to hit a target, things like the vehicle's suspension can throw off the aim of your fire control system. So the engine, transmission, and internal and navigation system were initially imported from foreign partners while they could troubleshoot the problem. For example, just the addition of the hydropneumatic suspension boosted up localization range from 45% to 70%. In layman's terms, a single degree change in elevation angle of an artillery piece trying to hit a target 20 miles away would result in a deviation of 610 yards, or 550 meters from the target. So localization range is extremely important, and 70% still means you'll miss 30% of the time. All of these issues would fortunately be later fixed with the incorporation of a better fire control system and a tactically advanced land internal navigation from Honeywell Aerospace, among other classified tech. One of the most important aspects is the armor. The Mil-12 560H armor on the K-9 is unique to Korea. It's actually made by their Korean POSCO Iron and Steel Company. Only their domestic version gets this special steel. You may have never heard of POSCO, but in 2010, they were actually the world's largest steel manufacturing company by market value, and they were named the entire world's 146th largest corporation by Fortune Global 500. POSCO currently operates two integrated steel mills in South Korea. Since this was domestically developed armor steel plates that were being used for the first time, the South Korean military researchers decided to produce and compare both imported and domestic materials to reduce the risk. In the meantime, Samsung began to train and employ master craftsman welders whose skills were verified by the U.S. Aberdeen Military Research Facility. U.S. researchers verified that the South Korean steel plates perform better than imported armor plates. It wouldn't be too long until the K-9 Thunder saw its first combat during the surprise bombardment by North Korea in November 2010. The 7th Artillery Republic of Korea Marine Corps were given orders to counterattack. 
One of their K9 cannons experienced a shell that got stuck in the barrel from a faulty misfired charge. They were operating the ANTPQ-37 radar system to locate enemy targets and incoming fire, but they quickly realized they lacked the adequate number of radar units to sufficiently cover the long, fortified North Korean coastline that the Marines were facing. Three of their four K-9 vehicles were hit during the surprise initial salvo from North Korea. It damaged internal parts and triggered an explosion in one vehicle. No casualties were suffered. They were able to successfully return counterfire, and it's a miracle that World War III didn't start from this. South Korea's Agency for National Security Planning, which is like their CIA, had been gathering information from North Korean defectors that painted a threat that couldn't be dismissed. It indicated that North Korea's goals in the event of war were to use overwhelming firepower and speed of action to conduct a one-blow, non-stop attack, with poison bullets thrown into the mix for good measure. Remember when I mentioned weapons of mass destruction? Well, that includes chemical weapons, not just nukes. And it was back then that North Korea began major shifts that favored chemical warfare. For example, many of the armored vehicles that North Korea produced were no longer armored personnel carriers, but rather self-propelled artillery suitable for the delivery of chemical weapons. They could fire out these new weapons. Now, the reason that this is important for the development of the K-9 Thunder is because it informs one of the most important but often overlooked features of the self-propelled artillery vehicle that you can probably guess. It's MBC ability, the ability to protect and pressurize the interior of the hull to be safe from chemical weapons. So the North Korean shift to biological chemical weapons did not come as a surprise to the Republic of Korea in the South because Kim Il-sung had issued back in 1967 a declaration of chemicalization, whose aim was to develop an independent chemical industry capable of weapons production, something that coincided with a 1979 US intelligence report that stated that North Korea had at least developed defensive chemical warfare capability. But that capability for independent production would be expanded to be able to load onto artillery dispersal shells. So what kind of threat are we talking about? Surely the backward regime can't be really hoped to win in a modern battlefield with chemical weapons, can they? Well, a study from the RAND Corporation reports that South Korea identified not one or two, but eight factories that can make a whopping 5,000 tons of chemical weapons a year in peacetime, and they can bump that up to 12,000 in the case of war. Meanwhile, another research center tells us that North Korea has 11 production and storage facilities, along with 13 research and development centers, two testing ranges, and four military bases equipped all of these with chemical weapons. This is why the K-9 has a pressurized seal hull. It's very likely that the inner lining of the crew's compartments have neutron shielding to protect against the radiation from nuclear explosions, as well as CBRN positive pressure and air condition systems, which can also be found in modern armored vehicles. The way MBC overpressure systems work is that they're essentially pressurized air blowers that blow air in from the outside of the vehicle through special filters. The armored vehicles are usually never perfectly airtight, so what happens is there's some air leaks inevitably throughout the vehicles and small holes. However, the air blowers have sufficient capacity to keep a positive pressure inside the vehicle of filtered air keeping the crew safe. So what happens if the K9 spends its 48 shells and runs out of ammo during a chemical attack? Does the lowest enlisted private have to run back through the gas into the rear and reload? No, the K-10 armored ammunition resupply vehicle was designed to meet the demands of modern warfare by providing efficient and automated ammunition support. It's like the R2-D2 of the K-9 artillery piece, except it's not cute. With a shared chassis, power pack, and suspension, the K-10 ensures seamless logistical support and tactical coordination with the K-9. The K-10 is rated to automatically transfer over 70,000 units of ammunition at a rate of 12 rounds per minute, and it's compatible with various types of ammunition. It even allows for selection of specific projectiles and charging the required types of shells even in darkness. It basically just hooks up to the K-9 and sends the shells through without having to get out of the vehicle. Right now, the South Korean K-9 Thunder is the most popular tracked self-propelled howitzer system with over 2,000 units in service around the globe. It has over 52% of the market share. With current variants operating in Turkey and the Indian Army, who's a prolific buyer of Russian equipment, actually adopted the K-9 themselves. Thank you for watching. If you're interested in continuing to innovate with me, then consider signing up to join the exclusive YouTube members tier for monthly extra videos that are too spicy for me to post publicly. There's also this new t-shirt that we have available for you, the Gumby Operator, or I think Legal just told me we have to call it the Umby Operator, or the Fubar and Grill t-shirt. Thank you for being a part of the first million spare parts army subscribers, 
and I look forward to seeing you real soon.